I want to offer you the top 10 reasons that I actually think we should be hopeful. Anyone want to hear that? 10 reasons? Yeah? 10 reasons. 10 reasons. Can Jones come up with 10 reasons? So the number one reason we're going to be hopeful is we have a vision. And I'm going to send us over to a little exercise. We have been developing these global climate models. They used to take a week to run on a huge computer. They now run on this laptop. And anybody can put it on your phone. And so what I'd like you to do is to think about our vision. What is our vision for addressing climate change? I showed you temperature. And here it is going from 2,000 out to 2,100. If we do nothing, it goes all the way up to 4.2 degrees, which is a world we cannot adapt to. The goals are this dotted line, 1.5, or this one, 2.0. We want to get well below 2 degrees, is what the Paris Agreement said, with an effort to get to 1.5. Because number 10 reason of why to be hopeful is that we know what it's going to take. We have a vision. So over here, I'm going to type in, and you could go to Climate Interactive and down this on your, download this on your phone. We're going to start with Steve's number of 2030. So look over on the, on the top, and as I hit it, you should see the line flatten. There it is. OK, instead of that, we get that. Instead of 4.2, 3.4. Yay, boo, right? It's, it's better, not good enough. It happens that our job at Climate Interactive is to add up all the pledges of the 195 countries as a parties to the Paris Agreement. And our calculation right now is that this 3.5 is what all the pledges to Paris would deliver. All right, but someone, didn't, someone else said yesterday. So let's peek earlier. Let's say, how about, well, how about tomorrow? How about 2018? OK, 2.9. Did that solve the problem? Is it better? Better is good. Better is good. Here we go. All right, what about reducing emissions? When do we need to start reducing emissions? Let's make it in two years later. And anyone have a sense we um, would need to reduce emissions 1% a year, 2, 3. Brad Rouse says 4. Let's see what we get with 4. What do you think? Watch over on the right as it goes down 4% a year. Hey, 1.6. That is well below 2 degrees. You see that we peaked in 2018 and 2020. We began reducing 4% a year. Now, the challenge of this is if you bring on renewables really swiftly and energy efficiency and use it to drive down burning coal, oil, and gas, you roughly get a 3.5% reduction in emissions every year. So this is faster than that. This is saying to get there, we're actually going to need to actively shut down fossil fuel capacity before the end of its useful life. It takes more than just, let's let the market drive this transition. It would take more actively keeping coal, oil, and gas in the ground. It also could be helped by, well, what if we get more action on deforestation? And what if we grow more trees, which I know this community is really good at. Boom, 1.5. This is the vision. This is the vision. This is it. You clap loud. It's it. Folks, for us to fight as hard as we're going to have to fight and work as hard as we're going to have to work, we are going to have to fall in love with this. OK? Fall in love with the vision. This is the vision. So the 10th reason, reason number 10 to be hopeful is that we have a vision. We know what we need to do. Reason number nine is we've been collecting data about what's actually been happening. And some good news is that emissions may have peaked. May. Because if you look in this circle at these last years, these last 10 years or so, show that emissions have been going up. But these last few years, they've been slowing their growth and flattening, even as total GDP, that is overall wealth, has been growing. So the point is, we have been figuring out how to decarbonize the global economy in many ways. And I'll show you more about what's happening internationally, which is where this matters the most. But so reason number nine is that emissions actually may have peaked. Reason number eight that we should be hopeful is that the clean energy revolution is soaring on its own 
energy, its own forces right now. The key thing is the markets now are driving things. And this is a really geeky graph, but there's some words in here in the middle. Wind costs have fallen 60% since 2009. Solar PV, modules, a 99% drop since 1976. Modules cost 99%. Can you do that? How do you calculate that? That's inconceivable. And 80% just since 2008. The cost has been coming down and down and down. It's also happening in electric vehicles, lithium ion batteries drop tremendously. This is their price falling over time to the point where we expect electric vehicles to have the same cost as internal combustion engine vehicles on a capital cost basis by 2024. All right, so that was reason number eight. And it's a big reason to be hopeful, is that the markets are driving some of these changes that we really need. Finally, reason number seven is that People around the world are supporting carbon prices. 40 national jurisdictions, 24 subnational jurisdictions putting a price on carbon. Here's a map of many of the places around the world. Seven of the largest global economies out of 10, seven out of 10, have a carbon price. OK, that's reason number seven. Reason number six to be hopeful is China. And just as I said about peaking overall emissions, Production and consumption of coal from 1980 in China may have peaked. We think that well before people were expecting it and well before they promised it, consumption of coal in China has peaked. They're having more natural gas. They have a lot of renewable energy because they're super smart and they know they're going to create a lot of jobs and economic growth by selling PV panels to the world. <laughs> because they're really smart that way, and they're using them at home such that production and consumption of coal has actually peaked. Reason number six to be hopeful. But one thing that's really helping is reason number five, which is the Paris Agreement. The Paris Agreement is a solid complement to all the things that you just heard. Okay, It's not going to solve the whole problem. It is a solid complement to helping 195 nations set goals and get organized to address them. A lot of our work is to do the math on how much do we need to reduce emissions by 2050 in Thailand and Brazil and Indonesia and Mexico and Russia and Nepal, all of the countries that we don't think of as just the US, China, EU. There's so many different countries that are thinking about their decarbonization by 2050 or later, aiming towards net zero emissions. It's a remarkable breakthrough that we've seen and will continue to complement everything that we've seen. So we should still feel good about that and know that even if tomorrow, because it might happen tomorrow, if it's announced that the US may pull out of the Paris Agreement, it would take four years to do so. So when they wrote it, they made sure, I don't know if they said it on the US election cycle, but it takes three <laughs> years to pull out. There's a one year delay. So it does take four years to, to, to exit. <laughs> yeah, it takes for you. There you go. You like that, right? OK, so this has all been very global. This has all been very global. I now want to bring it a little closer to home, because we've got four more for the last four. So this other one, there's a whole wing of research at Climate Interactive led by Beth Sawin, who I work with, about what we call multi-solving. And the idea of multi-solving is to recognize that there are many benefits to keeping coal, oil, and gas in the ground other than future generations and the impacts of climate change. So there are amazing opportunities to improve food and water, jobs and assets, health, well-being, connection in a community, energy industry and mobility, and resilience if we do all these things together. Can we be systems thinkers as we, as we address climate change? Some scientists in the European Union studied it. And, and what they found is that if the European Union improved its pledge and did even better than it already is committed to, the numbers are, are baffling here. By 2020, they think you would save 140,000 additional years of life 
13 million fewer days of restricted activity, 1.2 million fewer days of respiratory illness, fewer consultations and hospital admissions. Why? Health, because of air pollution, because coal and air pollution is just such a draw on our health. There are so many benefits that would pay for the actions we need to take. Now the challenge is the health benefits get realized here. The investments in clean energy and energy efficiency and agriculture and well is over here. How do we line up that money such that they can benefit from these investments that we know will pay off? So it's about money, it's the, energy, the income burden, it's about health, it's about quality of life, and these are often the most vulnerable people to the impacts of respiratory illness, not at, they don't have access to health insurance, et cetera. So how do we help vulnerable people and address these other issues while we're making a dent in climate change at the same time? How do we adopt a multi-solving perspective? So the reason I'm, one of the reasons I'm hopeful is that we have multi-solving. It is a way that we can address these issues. The next one is what I think is the next battle effort of the Energy Innovation Task Force. So there, this is an active effort by the city to say, let's see what we can do, I think, to mostly reduce energy demand so we don't need another power plant. I put it out as the challenge. And really, that's the theme of this last part, is you see what's going on. What is the role that you can play? I hope there are ideas that are coming. If these can be my contributions to all of this work. All right, reason number two of the 10 that I, Drew Jones, am hopeful is that there is a huge movement with a ton of success at divesting our investments from fossil fuels. So Steve, who's sitting up front here, um, received an honorary doctorate from Williams College, which is really great for all this work in education and he then said, Williams, would you please divest? They said, no. no. So Steve went up there and in person took his honorary doctorate and handed it back with all due respect to the president of Williams College. So stay, Steve, stand up. There he is. Give him a hand, like a real hand. So what? The question for this is, what is the role of personal sacrifice in this movement? So who's gotten some joy, some pure joy, out of pulling their money out of fossil fuel companies? I know I have. It felt good. It felt good. It felt good. So let's think. What do you think is the number one reason from this year of why I am hopeful about climate? The thing that's happened in the world is Standing Rock. Yeah. Give a hand for this. So this movie, you saw it in the press. People led by Native Americans of many different groups coming together to put their butts on the line to say, no, we are the water protectors. No, this is not going to happen. We are keeping the fossil fuels safely in the ground. And the reason that I think it is so hopeful is that what's happening is that we are seeing ourselves in this climate movement as connected to many other social issues, many other racial groups, many other causes, not just the future and not just, frankly, the leadership of, that has led us so far. Tall, straight, white guys, right? John Muir, David Brower, Bill McKibben. You know, I'm in this whole tradition, and it's great that we have been done so much. But what happened in Standing Rock is a lot of the traditional, those leaders stepped aside and it was the vulnerable people themselves in the leadership, no individual, but broadly shared leadership that made something really beautiful happen. This movement reaching across traditional boundaries in order to build the support. Now how to do it, I don't know, but I love it. Where do we get grounded? And maybe get your feet back on the ground here, like, because this will be the power from which this movement has impact when we are able to really see the faces and see the places that are worth doing all that we can for. Some of the things, we can't always see the faces, but we've seen the images. Have we seen these images? 
just not right. It's just not right. This just isn't right, my friends. What we're going to need to do is move forward together. And the key word there, we've always been trying to move forward, but we've got to do it together now. There's a together that's new that we need. Forward together. And right now, we're feeling a lot of pressure. And that pressure we can frame as not a new direction, but as the last desperate gasps of a way of living and being that is done. Amen. Amen. The pressure could be the last desperate gasps of a way of living that is done. And the emergence of something that we know has been brewing since the 1890s and we've all been part of. So we're not taking a step back. We're not taking a step back. We're moving forward together, not one step back. We're moving forward together. Not one step back. Forward together. Forward together. Not one step back. Forward together. Not one step back. Thank you very much. Go get them.